Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our first all virtual Mountain Park staff training. Today, the topic is domestic violence awareness. And we know that because of COVID-19, cases of domestic violence are going up. And we know that this is something that is impacting our patients. And we want to have some tools to be able to best help our patients. Also, um, we know that this is impacting each other as well and our fellow employees. In this 2018 all staff survey on domestic violence, a question asked was, have you or someone you know at work been impacted by domestic violence? And 40% of employees answered yes. And so we know that this is also something that is uh, impacting our Mountain Park community as well. A few things to know during this presentation, it is being recorded so that other Mountain Park employees can learn from it and use the information here in the future. Uh, a lot of you already submitted questions prior to today. And so the presenters have incorporated it into the presentations. Uh, but if you still have a question, please feel free to email it to me. And there's my email. And if you do email it, um, then I won't reveal the name of the person asking the question. And then also you are all muted. So please be sure your mic stays muted. So I would like to thank our presenters for joining us. We have a lot of experience. Uh, with us today. And first we have Dr. Tracy Dixon. A lot of you already know her. She is our Behavioral Health Services Integrated Health Manager for the East Valley. We also have Sergeant Heather Maldonado from the Domestic Violence Unit at the Phoenix Police Department and Doreen Nicholas from the Domestic Violence. She's the Domestic Violence Unit Manager at the Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence. And both Sergeant Maldonado and Doreen Nicholas have been uh, working on domestic violence issues for more than 25 years each. And so between the three of them, we definitely have a lot of experience and a lot of good information for us to learn. So let's get started first with Dr. Dixon. So, hello everyone. So the question that we wanna start with is what is intimate partner violence? And I just wanna say that throughout the presentation, I'll be switching back and forth to, between the words domestic violence and intimate partner violence, but they are the same thing. Um, intimate partner violence has come up as a term in the last couple years. So intimate partner violence is when one person in a relationship is using a pattern of methods and tactics to gain and maintain power and control over the other person. And it oftentimes Involve a cycle. It's not just one instance that these um, that domestic violence occurs. And I think it's important for us to remember that anyone can find themselves in an abusive relationship. It's not the result of a character flaw. It's not the result of a result of something that the person did or deserves or brought on themselves. So I think it's important for us to take away the judgment um, about people who are in relationships that there's domestic violence. The other part I want to mention is in domestic violence, the perpetrator, the abuser, oftentimes presents him or herself in a very kind and loving fashion at first. Um, some people refer to it as a grooming stage. Um, so that's just something for you to be aware of. And the other thing I want to mention that's really important is abuse is not the exact same as conflict. So you can be in a relationship and have conflict. And in fact, conflict is quite healthy in a relationship because it helps you grow um, as a couple and as a human. So it is totally fine to have conflict. It's the defining factor between conflict or a domestic violence relationship is when there's fear. And that is the hallmark feature. So here are the stats. Um, so I want you guys to realize, I mean, this is quite a huge issue and these stats were actually provided before COVID. So here we have one in four US women and one in seven men report experiencing intimate partner violence. One in five women in the United States have been raped and half of those have been raped by somebody that they actually know or their partner. For the LGBT community, the stats are staggering. So 61% of bisexual women, 44% of lesbian women, 37% of bisexual men, 
and 26% of gay men have experienced rape, physical violence, and or stalking by their partner. So those are huge statistics. Additionally, 3.4% of, uh, of transgender individuals reported physical abuse by a partner, and 64% of transgender individuals reported experienced sexual assault. So the LGBT community is a, a, ver a fairly large component of intimate partner violence. Uh, research is showing that the reason why the LGBT community is so largely impacted is oftentimes the perpetrator will tell the victim that this is just how it goes in our community. All the relationships in the LGBT community are abusive, which is not the case. And it's, in fact, very untrue. The other part is there's a fear of reporting in the LGBT community because law enforcement doesn't always identify domestic violence between same-sex individuals. They and oftentimes will only identify violence as a violence occurrence between a man and a woman, rather than a woman and a woman, a man and a man. So why are we talking about this now? For those of you that have been watching the news or reading newspaper articles, domestic violence is increasing substantially. However, the reports of domestic violence through law enforcement are declining substantially. And what we're finding is the reason is the opportunities to report domestic violence are getting wiped away because the victim can't get away from the perpetrator. In fact, the COVID-19 situation has created a perfect opportunity for abusers to be more manipulative, um, to do more surveillance of the abuser or the victim, my apologies. So a lot of times we've heard from survivors that, well, I didn't call the police because he or she kept telling me, do you want me to go to jail and get killed by COVID-19? The other part um, that we're often seeing too is Victims are hearing that if the perpetrator is in fact arrested for intimate partner violence, they will only be incarcerated for a few hours to a day, whereas prior to COVID, they actually were incarcerated for a few days. So there's not as much time to create a safety plan to get away from the perpetrator or the situation. I also want to say that prior to COVID, only half of the victims of domestic violence actually reported to police the instances. So you can only imagine that if there is no opportunity to make a phone call privately and ask for help, that and with COVID, the numbers are going to go down substantially. So what does domestic partner violence look like? So we oftentimes think of physical abuse, emotional abuse psychological abuse, but I think sometimes we overlook some of the common characteristics that we actually accept in society to a certain extent. One is extreme jealousy, especially within the teenage world. It's actually cool if your boyfriend or girlfriend is jealous, but it's actually uh, one of the huge features of intimate partner violence. Another thing is social isolation. So the abuser will actually isolate the individual from his or her family and friends that want good things for them. And obviously with COVID-19, there's ample opportunity to social isolate a victim. Another uh, example is using social status or privilege against someone. So in that instance, the abuser might make more money or have a higher social status so that maybe they can say, well, no one's going to believe you if they if you tell them that I'm abusing you because everyone knows me and loves me. So we hear that. Verbal abuse is quite common. And I know we've most people think about intimate partner violence in relation to verbal abuse. Another one that we see is intimate uh, intimidation and threats. So Frequently, if there's kids involved, the perpetrator will say, well, I'll take the kids away from you if you report me. 
I'll tell them that you're a bad parent or you're not fit to be a parent. I will threaten to tell your boss or out you that you are in fact gay or lesbian. I will tell your parents that you're gay or lesbian. So in those instances, there's a threat and anyone that is going to manipulate somebody else will use intimidation tactics like that. Emotional and mental abuse. So I want to talk a little bit about this. A lot of victim or survivors of domestic violence come out and report, well, I didn't feel like I could leave because I kept being told that I wasn't good enough. I wasn't worthy of being loved, that no one else would put up with all the weaknesses that I have. So I stayed because I just assumed that there, that, that person was right, that I didn't deserve any bit better. Uh, constant surveillance is another uh, feature of domestic violence. So there's many reports, and if any of you guys have watched like a Dateline episode, that the perpetrator will not allow the victim to make phone calls or talk to certain people without surveying what is actually happening in the conversation. Strict rules and behavior are another feature. So you can only wear this when you go out. You can only talk to this person at this time. You can only go to these places. You're not permitted to go X, Y, and Z. You might also find a restriction to access. And that restriction to access can be money, bank accounts, credit cards, cash, cars, transportation, phones, communication with others. We've heard of stalking occurring quite often. We've also heard, of course, of the physical abuse component. And then we also hear sexual assault being forced to engage in a sexual activity that you don't want to engage in. The reproductive uh, coercion is about purposely getting a woman pregnant to keep her or to control her. And we've actually seen that in some of our clinics. And then the digital abuse. So, and that can happen throughout the, la the lifespan, but the abuser will use social media to embarrass the victim and make embarrassing statements, show embarrassing photos, um, maybe even share embarrassing videos just to gain control and make that person feel less than. So why do people stay in abusive relationships? So as I was talking at the beginning of the conversation, the presentation is we want to stay away from judgment. And I think sometimes it's really easy to judge people on why they stay, but you can't judge a situation unless you're actually in the situation. So let's just take a moment to realize that. So here are the common reasons why people stay. Violence happens in a cycle. So there are good moments in abusive relationships. There's happy, loving moments. And those moments give the victim hope. And anytime that, and I'm sure all of you have experienced love where you have hope that the person in your relationship will change for the better. And that happens even in domestic violence relationships. The next one, risk of leaving or staying. So there's like a cost benefit analysis that the victim will do. And in many situations, leaving an abusive relationship is not the best, safest, or most realistic op option for survivors. Oftentimes, the actual leaving the abusive relationship is far more dangerous and life altering than staying. There was actually an article that I read earlier this week where a woman who works with domestic violence had said, people stay because they are afraid to leave, but people leave when they're afraid to stay. So the fear of staying actually has to outweigh the fear of leaving. And from an outside perspective, we have no right to judge when that is for the victim. The last one, violence is not always people's priority. So people may feel like staying is the only option. And with COVID, that's huge. They might have lost their job, so they can't leave the abuser. There is the threat of taking the children away. We've heard many times in their clinics that 
there's a threat of deportation or I will report you to the authorities. So right now, it's actually a lot more scary to leave for many victims of intimate partner violence. So what we really want to pay attention to is each person is an expert on their own safety. Each person knows the situation better than anyone else. So we want to move away from asking, why are they staying, to how can I help create an environment that makes the person feel comfortable to make healthy decisions for themselves? So what can domestic violence look like in our clinic? So common ones are bruises. So as an MA or a CSR, you might notice bruising on arms, neck, faces. Um, you might actually notice that when they check in or are answering questions, they don't have good eye contact. Uh, a lot of times victims of domestic violence will be very shameful of what's happening or embarrassed about what's happening to them. There might be hesitation to answer questions, or if they do answer the questions, they might give vague responses. If you do have a patient that brings the partner with them, you might notice that the abuser, and, you, and this is not in all cases, I just wanna state that, but the partner may be demanding to be in the room, or if the partner does actually make it into the exam room, the victim, the patient, might actually feel really nervous or awkward, and you might walk into the room as a provider or MA and like, what's going on here? Because it kind of feels awkward. And then you also might notice that the perpetrator, or well, you won't know at the very moment, but they might do all the talking for the patient. So that's kind of a green light or a red light. Dixon. The other thing I think it's important for us to cover here is that with long-term abuse, there's long-term anxiety, and anxiety always has a negative impact on health. So there might be pre-existing health conditions, but then with the anxiety of the domestic violent relationship, there are worsening of symptoms. So as a physician, you might notice that a patient is having more issues with asthma. They might have increased bladder or kidney infections. You might notice circulatory conditions, cardiovascular disease irritable bowel syndrome, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, uh, central nervous system disorders, gastrointestinal disorders like ulcerative colitis or IBS, joint disease, migraine, traumatic brain injuries. So those are commonly seen and actually increase in symptoms when a person's in a stressful environment. From a mental health perspective, Common things that we will see as a result of intimate partner violence is anxiety and depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, antisocial behavior. They don't feel comfortable in social situations. Low self-esteem, like we talked about before, uh, oftentimes there is the emotional abuse and the abuser makes the victim feel like they're not important and they're not worthy. There might be emotional detachment or ambivalent about relationships. There might be increased issues with sleep, whether they're sleeping more or sleeping less. And a true hallmark also for the victim is, or I'm sorry, alcohol or substance abuse. So you might see an increase in opioid dependence or any drugs that they use. For the adolescent community, what we see if they're as a result of intimate partner violence is depression and anxiety. We often see disordered eating. They might have food restrictions. It might lead to forceful vomiting. It might even involve taking laxatives, but it's the victim feeling that like they have control of something. Also, we see increased suicide rates and increased substance abuse. And oftentimes, those in adolescents that are a victim of domestic violence are at an increased rate of risk of having um, sex prior to the age of 15. That's pretty huge. Then we for women's health. I know I said towards the beginning of the presentation, sometimes there can be forced pregnancies. There might be for those women who are, in fact, um, getting pregnant, there might be a rapid repeat. So 
a patient might get pregnant fairly quick after a, the other pregnancy. They might enter into prenatal care late. There's also for the babies that are in the situations, there's a low birth weight for babies. There might be, there might be preterm birth. And what we've also seen with the men in such examples, if they're the abuser, they actually try to control or take away the birth control that the woman is using or might force her to have sex without protection to purposely get her pregnant. So what we need to do now that we know all of this is that if you're an MA or you are a CSR, make sure to let the MA know if you're the CSR or the medical provider. And I would even say in circumstances, all you have to do is Skype the clinic's IHSAs and they'll get a BHC to talk with the patient. In certain circumstances, CSRs have done an amazing uh, job of Skyping, letting the team know, and then I'll go talk to the patient just in an unassuming fashion to see how the patient's doing and if they're okay. And I think that's a great job. For healthcare providers, for you guys to know that and this is just a step for women, but anytime that they talk to their healthcare provider about experiencing intimate partner violence, they were more likely to seek advocacy, counseling, protection orders, and shelter. So as the medical provider, if you're in a room and a patient is disclosing or you're concerned about them being in an intimate partner violent relationship, it's important for us to be non-judgmental. You have to remember that in most cases, this is not going to be the first time that someone has shared their concern about the victim being in a difficult situation. So non-judgmental is absolutely pertinent. The other part is you can offer information and support. Just listening in silence is completely okay. In fact, I would say sometimes it can be quite powerful. And don't push for disclosure. So if you have a feeling that a patient is in a situation of domestic violence, but they're not telling you, don't push them to tell you, but just let them know that you genuinely care about them. And eventually, hopefully they'll come back and let you know how they need help. So with COVID-19, what the national standards are now is that medical providers or using telehealth visits to actually screen for abuse. As of a week ago, a lot of our behavioral health consultants started screening patients for abuse with these questions that are on the screen here of who of all is at home with you to kind of normalize the situation that many people are in of being in close quarters with their family. The next question would be, how is everyone getting along? So that's a good neutral statement. And you can actually use a sense of humor um, to kind of lighten the subject. Or, and the third question would be, do you feel safe there? And how they answer the question can be very telling. But if you feel like there's more there and they're not saying, that, well, they're saying to you that they are in fact safe, but you have a feeling they're not, it's okay. Um, if they don't tell you in that conversation, just let them know that you care and that you're here to help in whatever way you can. Violence unit at the Phoenix. If a patient ends up telling and disclosing to you that they're in a domestic violence relationship, here's some helpful statements that you can say. I'm glad you told me about this. I'm sorry that this is happening. No one deserves this. You can also say you're not alone. Help is available. And I'm concerned about your safety. Then you can do the nice warm handoff to behavioral health by saying, you know, I have someone on our team that knows a lot about relationships and how some relationships can negatively impact health. And then that's completely neutral and it gives an opportunity to not feel judged and just an opportunity and a space to report what they're experiencing. And in any situations, just know that disclosure is not always the goal. And disclosures do happen. The bigger goal is that we're not being judgmental of the patient and that we're offering a safe space for them. Department um, sources. 
Um, after this presentation, if you guys do want a copy of these, just email me. I don't care if I get 300 emails, but I will forward these resources to you. These resources are for Maricopa County specifically, and the behavioral health consultants have worked with these on a various level or two. These are all of our Arizona state level partners. So the Arizona Coalition to End Domestic Violence and Sexual Abuse, and then the Southwest Indigenous Women's Health Coalition. These are the national hotlines that I just want to briefly go over with you. So the National Domestic Violence Hotline is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day. And there's an opportunity to provide confidential one-on-one -on -one support for anyone who calls. They offer crisis intervention, options for next steps, and direct connection to immediate support for immediate safety for those that need it now. There are bilingual advocates available, and there's also a language line if that is needed. The next one is the Trevor Project. So this is specifically geared towards the LGBTQ youth. It is both a crisis line for suicide concerns and for domestic violence intimate partner relationships. That one is for ages 24 and younger. The National Sexual Assault Hotline, they will, if you call them, you'll be connected to a trained staff member from a sexual assault service provider in the area in which you live. And of course, that conversation will be confidential. Strong Hearts Native Helpline is a great resource for Native Americans that are needing a safe space to anonymously report um, any abuse that's occurring. Now, for them, they, they're not open 24 hours a day, but they're open from 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. And then if you call after the hours that they're not open, then the call will be directly routed to the National Domestic Hotline. And the last resource I, offer, I put on here, because we do see this at some of our clinics, is human trafficking. So this number, the National Human Trafficking Hotline, is toll-free. It's anonymous. So you can call as a victim or survivor of human trafficking, or you can even put in a report, uh, anonymous report about it. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Dixon. And now we have uh, Sergeant Heather Maldonado on the phone, and she is with the Phoenix Police Department. She has worked in the domestic violence unit for 26 years, and so she will be sharing information with us. Well, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I love talking about domestic violence to just about anybody that will listen. And the, the importance of all of this right now amongst COVID brings a lot of light to it, but it's an epidemic that goes on before and after everything COVID. So when it comes to the domestic violence stuff I'm coming from the criminal perspective right because I work for the police department I've done the domestic violence as a supervisor now coming up on three years and I was a detective previously for another five years before so I've seen the damage that domestic violence can do to families um, to individuals um, to the suspects themselves um, there's a ton of resources out there and things along those lines I'm going to hit on some stuff that Dr. Dixon um, touched on as well. And, um, you know, she's coming from that medical perspective, which is entirely valuable. And I'm coming from the law enforcement perspective, which is just that the, the cops that are responding to the scene um, where crimes have already occurred, not necessarily um, before anything has happened. When I'm talking about coercive control, which is, again, something that Dr. Dixon touched on. There's five different facets um, to the course of control that an abuser will use. Not every single abuser out there uses these tactics or all of these tactics. Some people, um, male and female alike, they just like to beat up each other. They're not trying to control another person. They're just angry. Um, for whatever reason in the whole world, they're angry that the sun came up in the east. They're angry that the sky is blue, you know, whatever it might be. I'm certain that you guys will come in contact with patients that will talk about some of these things, as well as friends, family members that may talk about some of these things. And they're just, they need to be red flags. So I realize some of it may be redundant, but we'll go on to the um, next slide to explain what the course of control is. This is based on Dr. Evan Stark, who authored a book of how men entrap women. 
And I know that that sounds very lopsided when it comes to um, how many female suspects we may have, how many male suspects we may have. So I'm going to take a, a quick detour here for the Phoenix Police Department, which is only the, all that I can speak for. So Phoenix Police last year, 2019. 31% of our cases involved female suspects. 31%, that's a historically high number. That means only 69% of our cases were men as suspects. So we have a lot of men out there that are victims, one. Two, we have a lot of men out there that are, um, that are being accused of crimes, right? Um, the same way that, that, that women are. But some of this are same-sex relationships. Some of this are brothers and sisters, um, mothers and daughters, um, and things like that. So keeping that in mind, when it comes to coercive control, though, coercive control, based on Dr. Evan Stark's research and everything that I've experienced in my 26 years, when I'm really trying to deliberately control a person using all of these techniques, 90-whatever percent it's a male doing it against a female, okay? Um, so I, I'm going to use probably a lot of examples, and I will use male suspects, but I'm talking in this course of control dynamic, not so much in general domestic violence all the way across the board. Um, the other statement to this is in the LGBT community, generally speaking, and very generally, there's one person that's a little more dominant. So this course of control technique can be involved in a uh, homosexual relationship, not always having to be male, female, right? So in a same sex relationship, this could occur because one person's a little more dominant, but a strategic and deliberate course of conduct using all of this to deprive a person of their basic rights and resources because they want them all to themselves. I don't want any other buddy, anybody else looking at you because you're mine. Um, and whatever the psychology is that goes with that, if it's a fear of rejection, I have no idea. But we'll talk about the next slide of being with violence, the most recognized form of domestic violence that everybody generally knows, the slap, the hits, and things like that. Um, but we have the criminal damage. You know, I'm, I'm going to slash the tires so that you can't go to work, and now you're going to lose your job. Um, I'm going to threaten suicide. So that um, you don't leave me, because if you leave me, my blood is on your hands. And who wants that, right? Nobody does. But the idea for abusers that use coercive control is just enough to keep you around, keep you coming back, lay that hook in you so that you don't ever leave. I'd like to hit on strangulation real quick. Strangulation is somebody using either their hands, their arms a belt or a wire to cut off somebody's air around their neck. It should be an attempted murder, um, but just strangulation by itself is, is a huge lethality indicator. If you have patients coming in, friends or family that talk about how they got choked last night, um, they thought they were going to die, or you see the marks and redness on their neck or scratches, um, that's a huge deal. Um, I would encourage you to encourage them um, to call the police um, so that we can get a forensic nurse examination done. And that's with a registered nurse. It's all medical. Um, they take pictures of all of the injuries and whatnot. But the strangulation is a great physical violence, coercive control technique, because what the suspects are doing is telling you, I can kill you. But I choose not to because I love you, right? Um, and she's looking at him with her bloodshot eyes from all the broken blood vessels in her eyes um, with her sore throat because she um, nearly died. And he's talking about how much he loves her. Abuse during pregnancy is another big one. It shows a complete disregard from a suspect using coercive control, a complete disregard for life for the victim, for the life of the baby, um, and the lethality indicators on that are very high. And when I talk about lethality, what I'm talking about is the, the chances of the victim being murdered by this person. Um, and so when, when you see those kind of things, um, just make notes, talk about it. Um, and we'll talk about resources here in a second, but 
Those are red flags. And the hairs on the back of your neck should stand up when people start talking about that. Or if you've experienced it yourself, the hairs on the back of your neck should be standing up because that's a big deal. And if stuff that happens to our, our victims out there on the street can scare a cop or make us go, wow, girl, you're in danger. Um, out of all the things that cops have seen out on the street and you can still scare us, that tells you something. And, or at least it should. It should go, oh, wow, if even the cop thinks I could die, maybe something could happen, right? Is, is with regards to isolation. And Dr. Dixon talked about this. But I want the coercive controlling abuser wants to get the victim away from anybody and everybody that's going to tell them to leave. Anybody that's going to tell them, girl, you're in danger and you need to leave him. They don't want you talking to anybody like that. And so I'm going to move across town. I'm going to move to another state. I'm going to take you from Mexico and move you to the USA. And then I'll use deportation um, over your head. Um, but the separation from family, you know, your mom never liked me anyway, and they're just jealous of our love and things like that. I'm, I'm helping you because you told me all about the abuse that you suffered at your father's hands, and I don't want you to be around that anymore. So they're like, well, yeah, I did tell you about that. And yeah, it is dangerous and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they're being bombarded with why this person is better for them, what's wrong with their family, their friends, their job, why they can't go out, how useless they are and everything else. And so that starts adding to the isolation. They get afraid to go outside of the house because they don't know what's going to happen. You know, am I going to be you know, kidnapped by a family member because they're trying to save me or uh, you know, whatever, because of whatever the uh, suspect is telling them. Being kept from medical care, that's a big one right now. Um, with the COVID stuff, I can beat the living daylights out of you and then just not take you to a hospital because of COVID. They're not going to let you go to the hospital because of COVID. They're not going to let you do this and that because of that. Um, so um, we have a lot of uh, victims that are still being able to escape, which is amazing. But um, we have a lot that I'm, I'm certain um, when this restriction is lifted and people can come out, I'm certain our cases will go up even more. So I'll hit on that real quick when it comes to the um, the cases for the city of Phoenix, again, which is all I can speak to. The cases for the city of Phoenix from March were up 23%, up 23%. We received more than a thousand cases for the month of March. In April, we were up 20%, which generally speaking, the city of Phoenix we are up every month incrementally, 3%, 5%. But to be up 20% of cases, I only have 23 detectives to handle these cases. We touch every single one with a reference check, with either contact out to the victim or the suspect, um, and, and uh, managing our caseloads that way. But when it comes to this isolation aspect and when people are going to be at, let out, which, you know, maybe by the 13th, according to what the governor said, um, I expect our cases to go up even more. I would anticipate your cases would go up even more and more people being able to get out going, oh, thank God, I'm out of there. You wouldn't believe what the last two months have been, you know. Um, the next slide talks about intimidation, the threats of violence. Um, an abuser can say something like, remember what happened last Saturday, and then just give you that look. Um, you know, that look that you can get from your parents, all they have to do is look over the top of their glasses and you're like, ooh, I better listen. Abusers do that. And, and they make those comments like, you know what's going to happen. So you better stop doing that. Or you better get me a beer. Or you better make sure my dinner, is, you better not wear that. I saw you looking at that guy. You better not look at him again. Right? Um, the use of the legal system, deportation and DCS is another huge one. You're a terrible mom. I'm going to call DCS. They're going to take your kids and things like that. Um, when it comes to that part of it, we have to help them understand that a simple, um, a simple one person phone call to DCS generally does not end up with DCS believing everything that person says 
and then coming out and ripping kids from mother's arms. That's just not how it works. They require an investigation as well. Okay? And we have to help them understand that process. DCS are not the bad guys. DCS are the ones that are trying to make do what they can to make sure the children are safe. They want the children to be safe. Mom, are you a safe person for the kids? And this is mom's opportunity to go, well, yeah, because he beats my butt every day. And, you know, I thought I was going to die last night because of this, that, or the other thing. So um, hopefully we can find uh, the families that you're going to have contact with, educate them on this DCS process, use them as that resource to help you get out of this relationship. Um, exposure of questionable decisions from the past. Um, and then the sexually violent um, incident. And again, that comes back to the, you remember what happened last Saturday when it may have been um, some kind of forced sexual encounter. So the intimidation is a big one. Let's talk about control. They control the money. So they can't, they can't go out and buy groceries the way they want. The vehicle use. We have many cases where the victims will say, um, Oh no, he watches the odometer. I can't drive all the way down to your office. He'll know that I went too far. Um, the, um, the, where she can work and if she can work, Dr. Dixon mentioned keep them pregnant. Oh, they love to do that because now you, well, you can't work because nobody's going to hire you while you're pregnant. So they keep them that way. Um, at the beginning of a, um, a relationship, um, you know, three months in, she's kind of like, oh, I'm not sure I want to stick around. And then next thing you know, you know he's not using protection. Well, we're going to be together anyways, right? No big deal. And and it's not necessarily um, with her consent that he's not using protection. But now that she's pregnant, she's mine. And now you're stuck with him for the next 18 years. Um, um, let's see. Controlling her ability to breathe by the repeated strangulations. We've talked about that. Um, time away from the home is monitored. So how long you're gone? I thought you were going to the store. Um, we had a case one time where the victim received a text message from her boyfriend that says, you have 15 minutes to get home. Just a text. Kind of freaked her out. So she calls our officers out and says, this is a threat. And the officers didn't understand why. Um, so he counted it down. You're down to 13 minutes to get home. Now, when you think about it, if you would have received a text message, you personally would have received a text message that says, you've got 15 minutes to get home, what would your response be in text? Mine would end up being something like, why are the candles lit and we got a romantic dinner plan? Yeehaw. Um, her response, though, was why, what did I do? This is an adult female, this is not a child. They have a kid. Her response is, why, what did I do to her boyfriend? If that doesn't kind of send a chill down your neck, right? Um, he counted down 13 minutes. Now you're down to 11 minutes. She responds with, babe, what's wrong? I'm trying to get home. I'm not going to make it in time. What did I do? And he just, nine minutes, three minutes, one minute, you're late. And so she called the cops, right? Because that's why she was late. Um, and, um, she couldn't articulate why that was so fearful to her. Our, our, our officers did not ask the right questions either when it comes to, um, what does that mean to you? Like, why is that so scary? She could have explained, well, the last time I didn't get home on time, I got assaulted, but she didn't know how to put that in words. And my officers didn't know to ask the right questions. So now as you're talking to your patient, you can come back to, this is what we know. Um, no, this isn't normal. And if it scares you and you have to call the cops, help them understand why it's so scary. If they don't know, because we have a lot of young officers out there. Um, let's go down to our sexual coercion slide. Um, it, Dr. Dixon talked about the for forced and coerced relations, so sexual assault. Um, that can happen if you're married. I can still say no. I've been married 19 years. And if I say no, that means no. Some people don't believe in that, right? You're mine. You're my wife. I can do what I want. Um, 
the the idea when it comes to sexual coercion is I'm going to do all this stuff to you, and then I'm going to go tell Nana, I'm going to go tell Nana that you that you like it like this, or that we had sex before we were pregnant. So if you leave me, I'm going to go tell Nana that I have this video, and I'm going to show everybody this video. I'm going to show everybody the pictures. That's a crime. They're not allowed to do that. Down here on the bottom right hand corner. Threats to share photographs or videos of consensual encounters, or excuse me, consensual sexual encounters is a crime all by itself. Um, so one, encourage our, our young ones to not share any pictures. Please don't do any pictures. Just don't even take video out, right? Um, but if you have and you're being threatened with that, that's a crime that you can report. So I would encourage you strongly to report it. The sexual inspection is on here. We had a lady that would always go home, get undressed, and her husband would make sure that she didn't have sex with anybody during his own gyne gynecological exam. She thinks it's totally normal. But when we were telling her, going, no, honey, that is not, not, she's like, what? She didn't get it. Okay. So I know we're running on time here. So we'll go down to our power and control wheel. Um, this is something you guys can print up. It's all over the internet when it talks about what everything that I've just talked about using coercion and threats and intimidation and things like that. So you guys can look that up and I'm sure Janie, you can show this with whoever needs it. The next slide is what a healthy relationship looks like. Cause I don't want to just provide all the bad information. This is what it's supposed to look like. If you will. Responsible parenting economic partnerships and stuff. Okay. Um, where to go for help? Consider a family advocacy center. Um, being able to go to Mountain Park Health Centers is amazing. If you encounter somebody um, either at work or at home and they don't know what to do, but they're ready to get out, go to one of our family advocacy centers. Um, we have several throughout the Valley. They can obtain order of protections there. We have that new system for the Arizona Protective Order Initiation and Notification Tool, Point, Arizona Point, where you go online, you fill out the entire petition for the order of protection, and then you print that out and take it to any court, or the court can print it out for you. You go to any court you want to, get it approved, and then it automatically goes in the system to be served. Um, we have our advocates available at all of the um, family advocacy centers. Um, we can do the counseling, um, shelter services, many of the offices, offices, not officers, um, many of the offices have detectives on site as well. Um, so it's a one-stop shop for the victim. And then lastly, the additional resources. You do not have to have a police report to seek help. Take it one step at a time. Talk to the people at the Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence. She's going to talk after me, which I know I ran long and I'm sorry. Um, and texting 911 is available. Um, all you have to do, you text your location, a quick address in there, and just write DV, domestic violence, he's hurting me. And that's it. That's all you have to send. Um, and then you can delete the text if you need to. But um, you can send that text and we will respond. Thank you so much, Sergeant Maldonado. But we're going to continue with Doreen Nicholas from the Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence. So um, I'm Doreen Nicholas for the Arizona Coalition and Sexual and Domestic Violence, and we kind of look at the bigger picture of what's happening in the state. Um, during this pandemic, we've been supporting the shelters to get all the protective gear that they need, masks, etc. Because of social distancing, they've um, decreased how many families they can have in a room, so that put us in a position to um, find alternative shelters. Some of the hotels and motels have been stepping up um, to um, assist. Um, we do the education and training. I've worked with Heather for years, been out to Mountain Park many times over the years. Um, we've got a helpline. Um, if somebody is undocumented as a survivor, um, Flores Shelter um, is a really good resource. Um, they work mostly with the Hispanic population. Um, but that can be a real barrier. And like uh, Tracy and Heather alluded to, this COVID-19 pandemic has really um, highlighted how 
Um, isolation is quite the tactic, and abusers truly use the um, isolation that comes with COVID-19. People, um, the it's called de coloris, D-E-C-O-L-O-R-E-S, de coloris. Um, so people might have worked or gone to school, and that might have been their outlet. That might have been, yes, de coloris. That might have been where they got support um, or were able to call for help and talk to an advocate. Um, but, you know, not working, being at home with their abusive partner monitoring um, everything, it's been harder to reach out for help. When things went on lockdown in mid March, um, for two weeks, our helpline calls decreased and then they've been on the upcrease. Um, like um, Heather said, the calls for P Phoenix PD have been going up and this has been the same for their crisis calls. Some of our advocates around the state are reporting that the cases they're getting in their clinics and um, for, for forensic nurse exams are that much more brutal than they've seen in the past. Um, we're anticipating when things start opening up, um, like Heather, um, that we're gonna get a big increase in calls. Um, and, you know, just know the coalition is here, 602-279-2900. Um, I'll put, um, this will be on the slides there too, but I'm putting our email in the chat box. Um, all of the programs around the state are on our website. Um, so just look for help and resources and you can find the shelters and the shelter numbers from around the state. But Jania, it seems like um, we're gonna have to do this again and come back to this and keep the conversation going. Just know um, for the people that you work with and for yourselves and family members that you're concerned about, there are people and places and resources out there to help. Nobody, you're, you're not alone. Thank you so much, Doreen. And absolutely, you, you, um, you nailed it. Uh, this is the start of a conversation. So it, does anyone want to ask a question um, in, in the chat? If there is a question that you'd wanna ask, and then Krista has a question saying that I've heard that during the pandemic, even if police respond to a domestic violence call, no one is being taken in due to COVID. Do we know if this is true? So Sergeant Maldonado, can you speak to this, please? Um, but the facts are, because fear not facts, right? Um, the facts are that people are absolutely being taken to jail when um, we can develop that probable cause for a crime to occur. And Susanna had a question about if you suspect that there's abuse, how do we protect the abusee? Because once they go home, it can get worse. It's really important that you get a number in their hand or a shoe card or some kind of resource. Your role in the healthcare center is to one, ask about it. And then if you go to the next step to make sure that they get resources, are exposed to resources, um, figure out how to separate them from their abuser for maybe a bogus urine test or something. Um, get that information in their hand. Make sure it's in the lobby. Make sure it's in the restrooms. Make sure you guys have some in the exam rooms. We, we can't protect people. We support them. We give them information. They'll make the, the moves and the decisions when it's right for them. And I can tell you for the BHCs in the clinic, we've had situations where we've had patients come in, report the abuse. They actually use the medical appointment as a, a reason to escape from the perpetrator. And we have called the police and the police will take them to a safe space. And we've done that on numerous occasions since I've been at Mountain Park. So that's always an option. But if they do say that they want help now and they don't want to go home, we will get them the help. Do we have any other questions? Okay, well, with that, I just want to, again, um, thank everyone for participating. Thanks, Sergeant Maldonado. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you, Dr. Dixon, for participating in this. And thank you to all of you because it's easy to uh, not want to, to hear about this or hear about this topic. It's a hard one with everything else going on. It could be easy to not want to hear more stress. But um, this is important, and we know that this could help uh, one of our patients, and it could also help one of our coworkers or even ourselves if, if there's someone who may be going through this. Hopefully, this helps. And again, we will put the resources uh, up on the internet so people can access. Uh, thank you for joining.